Hey everyone, and thanks again for joining us here at the Foundry Church. My name is Justin Colleen, and I'm the worship director here. We are so glad that you're here to see all that God is doing in and through his church right now. If you're looking to stay more connected with us throughout the week, make sure you go and like our Facebook page. There you will find additional content as well as the teachings that you see here on our YouTube channel. And speaking of, if you haven't subscribed for that yet, make sure you do that right now while you're here. Uh, with that said, let's go to our summer series right now, Judah, the Kingdom Chronicles. My name's David. I was a shepherd boy, the youngest of seven. Yet the Lord, the God of Israel, chose me from my whole family to be king over Israel forever. He chose Judah as leader, and from the tribe of Judah, he chose my family. And from my father's sons, he was pleased to make me king over all Israel. declared to me through the prophet. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him. So now, I charge you in the sight of all Israel, and of the assembly of the Lord, and in the hearing of our God, be careful to follow all the commandments of the Lord your God, that you may possess this good land and pass it on as in inheritance to your descendants forever. And I instructed Solomon my son and pled to those who came after to acknowledge the God of your father and serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches every heart and understands every desire and every thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. And these are the sons of David, Rehoboam, Abijah, Asa, Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, Ahaziah, Athaliah, Joash, Amaziah, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, Manasseh, Amon, Josiah. And now, Lord God, keep forever the promise you have made concerning your servant and his house. Do as you promise so that your name will be great forever. I am King Rehoboam. My little finger is thicker than my father's waist. My father laid on you a heavy yoke. I will make it even heavier. My father, your Great King Solomon scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. Flee to Jeroboam's kingdom if you want, but I sit on the throne of King David in Jerusalem. Hey, Foundry Church, we're engaging and diving into a brand new series that's going to walk us through this summer. And here's the thing, I don't think you'll want to miss a week because every week we are going to look at an individual within Scripture that falls into the line of King David. And this week we jump straight in with the son. So really what we're doing, it's important to note, we are, we are not going to look at King David really specifically. We do that in the video, which was awesome. And... Um, 
and we're not really going to look at Solomon. Those are the two more well-known kings of Israel. But for most of us, if I'm like, name five kings of Israel, and I'll give you a million dollars, we'd all walk out just as broke as we are right now, right? Because not many of us can know. Somebody's like, I think there's one who's like Jehoshaphat or something, and we only know that because there's an internal middle schooler in us that likes to say someone's name fat. Like, that's just the way we are. We're terrible. So, we're going to look into this. We're going to dive in and grab onto the identity of these people and also recognize that God is doing something in and through Scripture in these ancient stories, in these ancient people. He's teaching us things today. Who here has ever experienced selective hearing? Right? Now, who here has ever been someone who participates in selective hearing? So much easier. I just saw someone look at their spouse. That was awesome. All right. Um, so, like, selective hearing is kind of hilarious if you look at it. Um, if you're just watching in, you're like, how is that what you heard, right? I remember one of my very favorite movies, um, and it's probably not, you know, the right church movie, but it's one of my favorites. I saw it with my buddy Adam Norberg, and it was Dumb and Dumber. Oh, my goodness. Like, there was a point. Adam's this great big guy. He's a lineman. He's a huge guy. And, like, he was laying on me, and he was whimpering. He was laughing so hard. It was the, it's so funny. And there's this scene where Lloyd Christmas has followed this girl named Mary across, across the whole country. They were headed to a little place called Aspen. Remember, yeah, where the beer flows like wine. And um, they're on their way to Aspen. And Lloyd finally catches up to Mary, and he delivers her her briefcase. And um, and he says, and he's kind of like trying to hit on her a little bit. He's just smitten with her. And he says, you know, uh, Mary, what's the chance of a guy like me and a girl like you, you know, working out? And she just kind of goes, ah. Uh, and he's like, I mean, anything, one in 10, one in 100. And she goes, more like one in a million. And the look on his face, he's like, so you're telling me there's a chance. And he's like, yeah. Ooh, and he walks around pumping his fist. And you're like, oh, you missed the message. That was a profound moment of selective hearing. Today what we find in the story of King Rehoboam is selective hearing. King Rehoboam is the king that follows on the heels of King Solomon, who is the son of King David. King Solomon had populated Israel with gold and silver. He was a phenomenal king. And then Rehoboam comes. He was appointed king after the death of Solomon. The people of Israel said this to Rehoboam. Mercy, your father worked us hard. Your father built a great kingdom on our backs. We need mercy. We need some help. And the elders, Solomon's advisors, Solomon's best men came to Rehoboam and said, these people will follow you and they will be loyal to you if you will show some mercy to them and let them have just a little space, just a little extra room. Keep some of their money. Don't tax them so hard. Don't work them so hard. That was Solomon's advisor's advice. Rehoboam goes and listens to his, well, his friends his advisors, the young bucks who are up and coming with the new king. And the young men tell him, and this is a terrible paraphrase, but the basic message is, you either, you either need to be tough with these people or you're going to be seen as weak. Rehoboam took the advice of the younger men. He didn't listen to the advice of his father's advisors. And what happens is the kingdom of Israel, there's 12 tribes, it splits it fractures. King Jeroboam takes the northern 10 tribes and creates his own kingdom, and Jeroboam rules in the northern kingdom of Israel, while Rehoboam is left with part of the tribe of Benjamin and Judah in Jerusalem. That's all that he has left, because he doesn't listen to the wise counsel of his father's advisors. He doesn't, he has selective hearing. So what I would like to do today is look with you at a scripture in this that helps us understand and know what is being, well, maybe some of the words of King Solomon that should have guided, guarded, and kept Rehoboam in his early days. Listen to this, the words of Solomon in Proverbs 1, 1 to 7. It says this, 
The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, for doing what is right, just, and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning and let the discerning get guidance. For understanding, Proverbs and parables, the sayings and the riddles of the wise. So that's what Solomon's saying. This is what I'm doing in this book. I'm trying to paint it for you. Here's his first real point. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom or knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And I would say, based on Solomon's description, his son Rehoboam proves himself foolish in his first few days of his reign. He proves himself foolish because he does not fear the Lord and he does not listen to wise counsel and instruction. And the kingdom splits. Israel literally splits in two, ten tribes to the north and two tribes to the south. The kingdom is divided. And after this, because of God's love and his his love for David and his promise to the line of David, God does bless Rehoboam. Rehoboam gets his head on straight a little bit when he loses everything, and he finds himself back on his feet, right? He has a surprising rebound from what feels like a knockout punch. He's doing a lot for the kingdom. He has his own family. Things are going really well. And whenever you hear that phrase in Scripture or your life, that's where you should step back and go, what's about to happen. Not because we believe in this balanced universe, but because we believe, I believe, that once things start going well, we get independent from God. We don't need him as much. We don't lean on wisdom and counsel because, I mean, look at me. I've got it together, right? We feel confident and we feel sure. And we begin to despise counsel and despise instruction. And what happens is that things for Rehoboam start going really, really well. He's having a renaissance of sorts. Having lost the 10 northern tribes, he begins to regroup, rearm, and re-prepare himself to rule a kingdom. And we find ourselves jumping to a scripture in Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 12. And this, this, um, this chapter is really highlighted in verse 12, which we'll read specifically. But here's, here's what I think is important. This is what it says, verse 1, chapter 12, regarding Rehoboam's reign. After Rehoboam's position as king was established and he had become strong. Okay, so after his position, his throne, and the craziness of the transition had finished, after he was established and had become strong, he and all Israel with him abandoned the law of the Lord. They abandoned the law of the Lord. Why follow God when I'm doing well myself? Let's, let's just say only Rehoboam does that. You and I have never done that, right? Right? Because for you and I, I mean, we're like, yeah, that's, that is me 101. When things are going well, I kind of puff up. I think I'm okay. And God has this wonderful, kind, loving way of deflating us so that we don't think we're the be-all, end-all. And we'll talk about that more. But the reality is, after Rehoboam's position as king was established and he became strong, what happens is he, and notice this, all of Israel turn away from the law of God from the law of God. And if we, if we remember the words of his great granddad, David, in, in Psalm 1, that the wise, the, the godly person meditates on the law of God day and night, and they're like a tree planted by streams of living water. Rehoboam would not be that tree because in 2 Chronicles chapter 12, God sends a king named Shishak from Egypt up and he literally lays waste to all of Israel. The lower two tribes, Judah, we'll call it. All of Judah is laid waste. All the fortified cities of Judah are conquered by Shishak. He had thousands of chariots. He was coming after Jerusalem. And he gets to Jerusalem, and literally there's like an exchange for power, a paying of tribute, and Solomon had made solid gold shields in the temple of the Lord. And they walked before Solomon with solid gold shields. And Shishak took them all, plundered the temple and all its fine jewels 
and things like that and took them away to Egypt. And he left Rehoboam on his heels once again. Rehoboam finds himself with no need for God, which means what? You get arrogant because you became strong. You get overconfident, but we have to look at this as a pattern of being for Rehoboam. The first thing that happens to him is he's young, he's insecure, he wants to make a name for himself. He's standing in the shadow of the great King Solomon, and so he's insecure, and his pride out of insecurity causes him to be harsh and lose control. Later in life, after God establishes him, his pride gets a hold of him, but it's not insecurity this time. It's arrogance. It's the self-made man mentality. He gets overconfident, and he forgets his need for God. So pride has two ends to it. There's insecurity, and there's overconfidence. A sense that I'm worthless and no good, and a sense that I am the all, be all, end all. And here's the reality. They're no different. They're both rooted in one thing that you're the center of the universe. Pride always puts us at the center. So if you're out there and you're like, I'm never, I'm not secure at all. You can be very prideful, but not secure. Just like an arrogant person comes off as proud, an insecure person who doesn't find their worth in who God says they are can be just as proud. We see it in the life of Rehoboam. So when we look at this, we need to understand that God, as a good father, is doing the hard work of discipline. And if any of you in this room are parents, oh, discipline's the worst, right? Like, I won't ask it because it's rhetorical. Anybody enjoy disciplining their kids? Right, from a timeout to if you spank your child or if you take something, a privilege away, oh, it's the worst. I didn't realize that when you grounded your kids, you got grounded too as a parent, right? I, until I, when that happened, I'm like, this is the worst. We have to stay here and make sure they obey. You've ruined my life, right? And then I become a middle schooler. Why me, God? Like, it's very, it's painful. But the discipline of God is mercy, the discipline of God is mercy. We always see it as God being angry with us. And there might be some righteous anger in God saying, do not live that lifestyle. But I think more than that, it's the mercy of God that says, don't be that person. In Christ, I call you to a different place. And Rehoboam was called by the law at that time to follow God, and God corrected him. God's mercy is seen in his discipline that he won't let us be willful, arrogant children who listen only to our own counsel. I think that is the mercy of God. God loved Rehoboam, the great-grandson of King David. He is not going to let him become his own worst enemy. I love that. God's like, no, no, no. No, no, we already lost the kingdom once. If you gotta lose most of it again for me to get this right with you, Rehoboam, I will. He punishes him with the war that happens between King Shishak and Egypt and Judah. He punishes him with that. And I want you to do something with me. I don't know if you remember, you've only seen it once, but in the, in the thing, in the monologue there, the, I don't know, what's the right word for it? Is it prologue, the video? It's a video, awesome, sweet. I'm a public speaker. Um, so in the, in the video that starts out, you, see, you hear King David speaking, and then there's the voice of the prophet and the pictures of the clouds going through the mountains, and it's this thing. And at the end of the prophet's words, he says that if he doesn't obey me, I will, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men. I will punish him with floggings inflicted by men. You see its fulfillment in Rehoboam's life. Because those golden shields are taken from the sanctuary. Rehoboam fashions bronze shields. And now he walks behind the protective barrier of something far less valuable because his own pride got in the way. He experiences the discipline of God. He experiences the discipline of God. Parents and children, we know that it's the most loving thing we can do to discipline our kids. But it is the worst it is the worst, and each child responds to different forms of discipline. And I don't want to. I don't want to get into a thing of like you know what's abuse and not. I I don't. I just want to say this: discipline is a parental mandate by God. And we have three children, and they all respond to different punishments. 
We have one who responded to a spanking. We have one who responded to a toy shelf when they were little. You put a toy on a shelf and they'd walk by and they'd be like, there it is, I've lost it forever. And it was like this memory of some horrible thing. For the, It was very devastating. It was very devastating. And then there's one who just suffers a remo- uh, an emotional relational break. So when I look at this, I understand that when you have to set a child apart and they're in discipline, it's hard, but it's the right thing. And I think as a challenge, a small moment of application in this teaching, I would tell you as parents, as leaders, that, that taking away certain privileges for a child to learn an example is a really good thing. I would say quit giving them awards when they don't go out and grind and earn it because they'll expect it when they're older and they'll be unbearable adults. They'll be unbearable as adults. When you as a parent have a child who will not listen, seek godly counsel from other parents, not parents who just have perfect little kids. I don't know if I trust them because I'm like, what would you do, right? But I want to go to a parent who had a kid who gave him a tough time. How'd you get down that bumpy road? How did you survive that? Help me see it. Help me see how you disciplined and loved your kids. Because here's what I've learned with discipline. It all revolves around confrontation, confession, and repentance. Never once, never one time in my life as a dad disciplining my children have I ever, not once, disciplined my children where I didn't have something revealed in me that needed to be confessed and repented of. It's a humbling experience. Because if you real, re, uh, wield the rod, you must also have humility at your station or else it becomes abusive. So when we look at this, we need to understand that we have to discipline our children. I would encourage you, church, discipline your kids faithfully. They need boundaries or they will run amok. If you wonder what I'm talking about, look at social media. Look around the dinner tables of this country. Look in a restaurant at families sitting together eating. Everybody's like this. We're addicted to our phones and everything else, and we're missing the life in front of us. And I would say show some discipline and say, you know what, as a family, no more. We're pulling some things back. We're removing you from certain things so that you have what? A safe place when you go home. Get their phones out of their bedrooms. If I can be so bold, stop letting them have phones in their bedrooms. Do you know what manner of content and chasing they endure in the night because you don't discipline them? Discipline isn't just punishment, it's boundaries. And discipline is what we as parents have in exacting those boundaries and holding them. It's what God did for Rehoboam, it's what we do for our children, and it's what God does for us. Praise God that there's boundaries. Thank God that he didn't let me run wild with my ego and my self-righteous mentality. But God does put the wood to me, so to speak, at certain times in my life. I'm finding myself apologizing more than being right as I get older, and it makes me super mad because I want to be right. I don't want to apologize anymore, but the reality is more often than not, I'm wrong. Discipline is something God does in his mercy. And as parents, as leaders, we must also live in the disciplines of this life. Giving godly counsel, wisdom, and discipline to the ones who are being raised up under us, but also in the Christian life we live. And understand that discipline is going to be part of your life. In Hebrews, the book in the New Testament, Hebrews, it says this. And it's interesting to me how Hebraic, um, how Proverbs like this reads. My son, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves. He chastens everyone he accepts as a son or a daughter. If they love you, they punish you. If God loves you, you'll experience punishment. It goes on to say, endure hardship as discipline. Jesus said, in this world you'll have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. And I think what Paul, or we believe Paul or Apollos or another author wrote this book, what they're saying in this is you're going to face hard things in this life. And sometimes God uses those hard experiences to be disciplined. And it says, endure hardship as though it's discipline. It says, seek God in the hardship and see what he's trying to teach you. 
God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined, uh, for what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined, disciplined and everyone underglo- undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate true sons and daughters at all. If you are an heir in the Christian faith, one of the bloodline of Christ, if you are a Christian, you will experience the discipline of God. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of the, Holy, of the spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our own good in order that we may share in his holiness. We become participants in the holiness of God when we allow him to discipline us and reform our character. Our character is changed and reformed as we are disciplined. Do you know in the old days when kids got in trouble, do you remember what they used to send them to? Remember what they called it? A reformatory? Do you remember that term? Yeah. There was these things called reformatories. I I don't know if they were around when I was young, but I remember hearing the words. What happened to, you know, little Bobby down the street? He's at the reformatory, and we're all like, yes and amen. (laughs) You know, because you knew why Bobby was there. But it was a reformatory. It was a way to reform, to transform our character from this broken thing, apply some discipline to it so that we can share in his holiness. No, uh, uh, verse 11, no discipline seems pleasant at the time. Preach all day. I was a child that got spanked. I was never like, awesome, I'm really looking forward to this. Can, you know, yes, sir, may I have another? No, I didn't like it. It didn't seem pleasant at the time, but it was painful. Again, yes and amen. But later on, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. I don't think there is peace in an undisciplined life. But there is a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. We can look at Rehoboam and say, did the guy have much peace? Did the guy have much peace? Was he trained by discipline? And I would say for you and I, we need to ask the question, three questions real quick. First, are we in a position, where maybe, maybe you're starting a new position, maybe you're in a new phase in your life, you, maybe you're an empty nester, maybe you're newly single, maybe you, you feel like you've been single too long. I don't know what it is. Maybe you're moving off to college. Are you in a new position in life feeling insecure? I would invite you to look to God. And seek counsel of people far older than you who've made the transition you're going through. Seek the counsel of godly people. Invite them into your life. God's counsel can come through the Spirit-filled church. Listen to God. Let him speak through his church, through his word, and in your life. And give counsel so that your insecurity doesn't root itself in pride. And you become someone who, out of your insecurity, abandons God. Be careful with this new phase you're in, whatever it may be. Transition times are times of great danger. And I would encourage you, if you're in a new position and you feel insecure, if you don't know what it looks like, I would invite you, next August, when all the students move in at Hope or Grand Valley, get in your car and drive around that weekend. All you hear is screaming. And it's not because they're happy. What the students are doing is they're screaming and the loudest one gets noticed and they're trying to find their place. Insecurity gets loud, it gets boisterous. What we have to do is step back, maybe quiet down and listen to the Lord. Second thing, are you doing well? Are you doing well in life? And at a, at a point where you could be risking getting prideful. I would encourage you to remember the second half of Rehoboam's story. Look to God instead of yourself. Don't trust your own wisdom. You know, you may have that mentality, I always kind of land on my feet, right? But what if it's on a naily board? Maybe you shouldn't trust your skills. You should trust where God's putting you. At some point, we begin to think higher of ourselves than we should. And I love, love, love how Scripture says, and I can't quote it off the top of my head where it is, but it says this, God is mindful that we are but dust. Have you ever read that? I love that scripture. It says he is mindful, he is generous of spirit to us. He is kind to us because he remembers that we are dust, that we are finite, that we are fickle. We are here for a while and in a breath we are gone. He remembers that we are dust. 
Don't listen to yourself. Lean into God. Let him speak, again, through the counsel of the church, the spirit-filled church, and the word of God. And finally, if you're being disciplined, God doesn't hate you. God doesn't hate you. I remember seeing a look on my dad's face that would literally make the sun melt. (laughs) I remember seeing my dad look at me one day. I was like, this is it. Today I die. Right? I knew my dad was going to have at me. He didn't. He didn't at all. He actually had to walk away. Why? Because he knew his discipline couldn't be in the anger I had prompted. And I knew he hated me. And because he loved me, he had to find a way to discipline me, not in anger, but discipline and deal with the behavior that was rooting into my life. It was a terrifying moment. And I thought my dad hated me. When you're under discipline, you feel hated, rejected, and unloved. But if you're truly loved, you are disciplined. If you are disciplined, you are worth the discomfort. Isn't that a great thought? If you're being disciplined, you're worth the discomfort. My kids are worth me being grounded at home, not because I like it, but because their character is under my care for just a little while, under Erica's care for just a little while. They're worth the discomfort. If you are being disciplined, let it be one thing. And I love you from God. I love you too much to let you walk down a road to destruction. Listen and obey God's loving concern to you as displayed in hardship and discipline. And know that even in the hardest of circumstances, God isn't through with you. He's redirecting you towards the right path. God takes, God guides the steps of those whom he loves. As the writer of Hebrews says, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his very own children. He loves you. He adores you. He's chosen that without you, he doesn't really feel himself. He's made you a part of him. So he's going to discipline you. If you're under discipline, know this. Not only are you being disciplined, you're being disciplined because you are loved. Pray with me. God, thank you for the life of Rehoboam. Thank you for the life that shows us in insecurity and in arrogance. We run the same risk. We run the same risk of being prideful. So today, we just lay down our titles of how we feel about ourselves. And we ask that, God, you would help us do the thing that Rehoboam didn't. Keep us mindful of the gospel and the word of God. May the word of God never depart from our lips and our hearts. And may we be faithful to you all the days of our lives. Lord Jesus Christ, we love you and we thank you for first loving us. Come, Lord Jesus, speak a word of correction, encouragement, hope, and direction to us, your church, who eagerly await the correction and discipline, but also the love of our Heavenly Father. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks again for joining us for today's message. If you are looking for a way to prepare yourself for next week's message, make sure that you click the link below in the description right now, and that'll take you to our weekly devotion page. Weekly devotions are a very important part to our weekly rhythm here at the Foundry Church. We really hope that God spoke to you in a powerful way today, and we cannot wait to see you again next week.